Hi, Lindy Goodall here from Lindy G Embroidery. Welcome to this class on lace. In this class, we're going to be focusing how to create beautiful freestanding lace with our embroidery machines. Now, I've got my little tree set up and decorated with a bunch of little lace designs, but if you don't do Christmas trees, no big deal because we just have snowflakes and little angels. And the snowflakes would look great hanging in a window during the winter, or the little angels are great for handing out as gifts. And because they're small and flat, they fit well in a greeting card so you can send them out to all your friends. Now I do have some much larger, more complex designs like this tree topper angel, but she also will sit on a desk or a table and I'll show you how she's made. So stay tuned, we're going to learn all about how to make great freestanding lace. So let's take a look first at this angel. She's two pieces, so she's got a head and wings and then she has a skirt and the skirt is held together by these little interlocking buttons. So once she's out of the hoop, all you really need to do is hand stitch two little gussets up here at the top, and it's just about, I don't know, three quarters of an inch, and then the wings will set inside the other ones. So the nice thing is that you can take her apart and store her flat, because she's totally flat. Now, to make her this way, you're going to need a large hoop, 200 by 300, but I've also designed her split apart, so even if you only have a 5 by 7 inch hoop, you can still stitch all the pieces and assemble her. Now another lace angel is this one, and she's really better designed for a 5 by 7 hoop because she has all these applique skirt panels, so that makes her sew a lot faster. And then she laces up the back to be assembled. Now if you look at her halo, I've taken her halo and made just a little halo and then used it as a little candle holder. So just because she's an angel doesn't mean you have to only make her as an angel. So when we're talking about lace, there are a lot of things that are called lace on the internet. And some of them are what I really call freestanding thread designs. And that really was my first lace design. I didn't even think of it as lace when I first digitized my design back in, I don't know, 1995. And I just thought of it as a thread-only design. I'd been to my FOF club, my FOF creative club, which was not an embroidery club at that time. It was a sewing thing. And we had an educator in, Patsy Shields, and she was showing us how to do free motion stitching on a burnaway product and to make a freestanding thread design. And I didn't particularly care for what she was doing, but my mind went into overdrive and I figured out, oh, I could do sunflowers that way, I could do this, I could do that. And that was the beginning of making lace. Now the issue was, I had a machine that only stitched about yay big, so I didn't do a whole lot with lace back then. And fortunately, we have learned a whole lot more about lace since then. I've learned more about, I studied lace, I looked at a lot of antique lace designs and heirloom lace, and that's really the way I style my lace. And that's what I think of as lace. Another thing that's come a long way is our stabilizers, and we'll take a good look at stabilizers because that's really key to making your embroidery look good. So let's zoom in, and we'll take a look at some designs here. This design is what I would call a freestanding thread-only design. It's not what I call lace. And what it is, it's, if I hold it up, you can kind of maybe see through my shirt a little bit. And you can see that it's got a light grid of stitches. And this is what you see a lot of called lace on the internet. It's because it's really easy to do. You lay down some um, opposing angles of fill stitches, you fill it with little satin elements, and you go, to, go around the edge with a satin design, and you have instant lace. And that's what I call this instant lace. Now what I think of as lace is more like these other designs. So here's one of my snowflakes. And the snowflakes are designed to look like crochet. I've done a lot of crochet snowflakes in my life, and so I decided it would be fun to digitize some that look like uh, crochet, and so that's what I've done with this one. This angel, you can see how it's more open, and it doesn't have that grid of fill. And this angel is a larger one, still fits a four by four hoop, and I've stitched this one in metallic thread. So you can stitch them in different kinds of thread. Now, the thing with the thread-only designs, the instant lace, here I've taken, uh, this is a gingerbread man, he's freestanding applique. 
And if I were going to do a freestanding filled in thread design, I would really rather use applique because with the fabric, you can get a much more interesting look. This one's sort of mottled, so it's kind of like a more cookie colored. And here's where I've taken that same design and digitized, redigitized the applique to be that layered fill thing. And I've used different densities just to see how it would work. This kind of darker one is a solid color, and these two down here are a um, two color twist. So you get a little more interesting look. But I still don't find this as pretty and as interesting as the applique. Now, I also used a matching bobbin. So if you're using colored thread in the top rather than white, you might want to create a, uh, get an extra matching bobbin. So here's some other examples of lace. And most of my lace I've left stiff. So like the butterflies, and here's one that's metallic. And I make them stiff by just not rinsing out all the stabilizer. These little lace pocket angels are probably the most popular lace design I have because they sew up pretty fast. They work on any machine. And what a lot of people do is they'll carry around a baggie full of these and they'll hand them out to people in need. They see, you know, someone who's down in the street and they just give them a little angel and it just gives them a little hope and lets them know somebody cares. The other nice thing people do with these is they'll give them to patients that are in for cancer treatments or other treatments where they might be going through some kind of machine that can't have metal and it's just nice to have your own personal angel. So your lace does not have to be stiff and thick. This lace, you can see it's very soft. This is actually the lid to a little heart box I made and I just made two sides and then where uh, the little scallops around the edges, I've run a ribbon through there, made a little applique bag in there, and now it's a little sachet. And that would make a great wedding gift. So let's talk now about the process of making lace. We're going to look at stabilizers, threads, needles, and all that jazz. So I'll be right back. So back in the mid-90s when I was first doing lace, we had two primary products available to us. One was a very heavyweight, water-soluble film. It kind of looks like plastic. And this, this was called Badge Master back then. It's still, it's still called Badge Master. But there, now we have a few more options. Ultrasolvy is another one. The problem with these is that, just like plastic, they puncture when you stitch on with, with a needle. And as it punctures, it starts to stretch and pull, and your registration goes to pot because you could end up stitching in just open air, and as it falls apart, it starts to pull. And the thing with lace is, all those stitches have to interlock. Because if they're not interlocking, then it's just it's going to fall apart, and you'll end up with just a wad of thread. Lace designs have to be specially digitized. So you want to make sure that you're getting a design that says freestanding lace and not just lace. So this is not a good choice. The other choice we had back then was a product called Heat Away, and it was a woven product that was treated in some way that you could iron it out and it would just vanish. And the nice thing about that was that it made your lace soft, which could be also be a bad thing if you wanted stiffness like for doing something that actually stood up and held its shape. The other thing, I've noticed that that product, which was by Sulky, doesn't seem to be available anymore as a woven product. It's now available as a film a melt-away film. And those are, once again, a topping not suitable for doing embroidery on. So it w might look something like this. This is actually a water-soluble topping, and it's very thin. And I don't use this for lace anymore either. So these filmy type things, things that feel like plastic and puncture like plastic, they're not a good choice for your stabilizer. The best choice now is this product. And this is Sulky is uh, Fabrisolvi. You can see I get it in the large bolts because I go through a lot of this stuff. Now it also comes in rolls in different sizes, so I suggest you start out with maybe a smaller roll, maybe one that's kind of more this size that might fit your hoop. But the, be the bigger you get your bolts or rolls, the more economical it is per square inch. So um, I just buy it this way. 
And what you can see is it looks like, kind of like tissue, and it, it's mm -hmm. deceptively strong. So a lot of times I'll stitch designs with just one layer, but it depends on my hoop. If my hoop doesn't grip well, 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 those long straight sides on our really large hoops, they don't hold the stabilizer so well. So a lot of times I'll use tape and kind of wrap that around. Or sometimes if our tensions are too tight, you'll notice that the stitches are pulling too much on just one layer, so go to two layers. So one layer or two layer, it kind of depends on the design you're sewing and how your hoop is and how your machine is. Now, I want to caution you, there's another product that looks quite a lot like this. This is Silky Soft and Sheer. And it, it's a product on the market. It's a lightweight, no-show stabilizer. So Floriani has one called No-Show Mesh. There are other ones that are like this. This is a cutaway, and it's very sturdy. I love it, but don't sew lace on it because it's not going to go away. So how can you tell the difference? Well, with these, they have labels on the end. And on products that don't have labels on the ends, I will take the product information and I'll just slide it inside the tube. So I always know what it is. Now, sometimes that can get lost. So what you can do is you can just wet a little corner of this. And it'll, if it turns gooey and goes, starts to melt, then you know it's the water soluble. Now one other product I'd like to caution you about. This is Wash Away Tear Away. And I love this product for a lot of in the hoop projects because it provides stability while I'm sewing, but it washes out. However, it doesn't wash completely out. It leaves little fibers behind. So this too is not a good product to use with, with lace. You want to use one of those wash away fibrous type things. Now, when we do lace, bring my mat over here so you can actually see my lace. You can see that we have a lot of stitches here. And this skirt uh, is somewhere around 200,000 plus stitches. And so that's a lot of stitching. And when you have a lot of stitching, the more stitches you have, the more pull it will create in your hoop. And the more pull, then you can start having registration problems. So if it pulls too much, then your lace is not going to interlock. So you want to make sure that not only are you using a good design, one that's digitized properly for lace, but you're also using proper technique. Because uh, just because the lace falls apart does not mean it's the digitizer's problem. It could be, but it might not be. So on this little lace angel here, I'm going to have the cameraman zoom in. So this little lace angel, pretty pretty tiny lace angel. She's called the Hope Angel. And she's available on my website. There'll be a coupon code at the end of this class where you can get her for 50% off. But a lot of people are making the, the special angel and setting the, the ribbon color to be whatever is appropriate for their cause and giving them out. And it's just a nice little token, a little gift that gives hope. And that's why she's named the Hope Angel. So next, we're going to talk about hooping. So let's talk about hoops. If I'm going to sew this little design, I want to choose the design, the hoop that's the smallest one that can comfortably com accommodate that design. And the reason is, is because I'm going to get much better stabilizing in here. So the bigger your hoop, the more bouncy it is in the middle. Also, if I were to start sewing multiples in this hoop, then I'm going to start adding more and more stitches. I'm going to get more and more pull. And it might not hold together by the last row of designs. Another thing to notice is that you see two colors in this design. But it's actually a three color design because of the way the colors are layered. And if you were to combine multiples in this, let's say that you could combine two of them in this hoop, say one here and one down there, you would not want to color sort. When you color sort, if you don't know what that is, it's going to sew all of color one in this one and all of color one in the next one. Then it's going to come back to the first one, do color two, color two, and color three, and color three. All that movement and pulling will start causing things to shift, and you might get malalignment. And misalignments in lace are deadly. 
because it can totally ruin your lace. When you look at a lace design, you're seeing not only the front, you're seeing the back. So you have to make sure that everything is perfect because you don't want to see any stray stitches that were on the back. Once the stabilizer is gone, you're going to see it on the front. So if I have a large design, like this skirt, obviously I'm going to need to put that in my larger hoop. So this will, this will actually fit kind of this way in a 200 by 200 hoop, I believe, if I'm, if I'm correct. Or you can sew it piece by piece. So let's talk about actually hooping and stabilizer. So here I have the stabilizer from the last time I've sewn this design. And what I've done is I've cut off a length off my roll, cut it across the roll, and just cut off a strip big enough to hoop. I'm not going to cut individual pieces because what I can do now is I can hoop this one, sew it, cut it out, and now I can hoop another one. Whereas if I would fold this in half, you can see it's not big enough to hoop. So sometimes I can get, you know, an extra, I can maybe even get another second one out or third one out of this, but probably not. And another thing I've done here is if I put this in the center, you can see that I have a gap over here. And what I've done is I've hooped it properly, but I've moved my design over. And this is another non-standard kind of bad thing to do because you get the best registration in the middle. And this design is a little over 8,000 stitches. So it's a pretty high stitch count design for such a tiny little thing. But this hoop grips really well. And I have a small hoop. And when I tap in the middle, it's not too spongy in any particular spot. So I wasn't too worried about this. I would not do this on a big hoop. For example, I would not hoop this and sew this up in the middle, up in the corner, because it just it starts to get funky. So I'm going to stand up to hoop this. And you don't need to see me stand up. I've already pre-tensioned my hoop. And what that means is I've set it up with the correct tension. I need to turn this around. I can't hoop upside down. Um, I've already hooped this before. And the last time I unhooped it, I just popped it out. So I know that my hoop tension is already set. And it's pretty tight because I do not want any slippage. And um, it's also pretty tight because I'm not worried about fabric damage. This is all going to be cut away. If I were had that kind of tension on denim, I'd have marks. So you don't want to have that tight on denim. You want to have it super tight. You want to make sure that there's no slippage along the corners. And this is about the only time that I will try to pull the stabilizer and make sure it's really taut. You don't want to do that with fabric because it'll stretch the fabric. So then if I had a big hoop and I was concerned about slippage, maybe when I was pulling my fabric, I noticed that it was pretty loose in there, but it was really tight up here and the hoop was really hard to get in. I am going to take some duct tape and I've just, I take my duct tape, cut off a strip, and then I tear it in half lengthwise. And then I'm just going to press it along the side there on the stabilizer and wrap it up the side of the hoop. And I'll do it over here. And I usually cut little notchy things there so it'll wrap around that. You don't want to get caught in any brackets. And that will help hold your stabilizer. And the cool thing is that this is really sticky, but it comes right off your hoop, as long as your hoop is not gummy already. And it'll come off your fabric, and you can use it multiple times. So I must always have strips of this hanging off my cutting table from where I've used it before. So now I'm ready to sew. But before we get ready to do that, we need to talk about needles and threads. So let's do that next. So I had one more tip I was going to share with you, and I forgot about it in the last little segment. But I showed you how to hoop economically for one layer of stabilizer, but what if you need to use two? And what I like to do is, in that case, I'll buy a roll that's sized for my hoop. And what I'll do then is I'll unroll the whole thing and roll it back, fold it in half. So the fold is back there at the beginning. And then all I'll do is put a clip on it to hold it in place. And then I'll roll off as much as I need, hoop that, sew, cut out my little piece, and then I'll unroll some more and hoop that way. 
So I'm always, if this is where my hoop attaches to my machine, I'm always keeping the roll off on this side. And because I have a clip there, I can unroll as much as I need to work in my machine. So that's just a cool little tip to take advantage of your stabilizer in the most e economical way that it's possible. This stabilizer is not cheap and um, taking advantage of tips to make it last longer work well. So I also save all my scraps and I'll put them in a big Ziploc bag or other container and then I can mix them with water and when my angel starts getting wimpy I'll just start her up again with some of this. So now we'll talk about thread. So people are always asking me what kind of needle and what kind of thread do I use for lace? Well, I use the same needles that I use for all my designs. I like Schmetz embroidery needles and I buy them in bulk. This is a box of 100 and these are 7511s and they're the size I most use often. This is what I use on my home machine. My commercial machine, I can get sharps and ball points. So an embroidery uh, needle is sort of a, somewhere between a sharp and a ball point. But on my commercial machine where I can get sharps and embroidery style, I will use a sharp because you want the, you always want the thinnest, sharpest needle that can penetrate the fabric without damage to the fabric, the needle, or the thread. So that's the golden rule of choosing needles. So do I use a metallic needle when I sew metallic thread? Nope. I use these or whatever suitable for my commercial machine. Now, some people say you should always sew lace with cotton or rayon. And here I've sewn that same instant lace design in polyester, rayon, and cotton. And I think this one was the poly one. And it's just, just a touch stiffer than the other two, but not significantly. And the only reason I know that this one is the polyester is it's got a teeny bit of sparkle in it, which I happen to know that my trilobal polyester has a little sparkle to it. This one is the cotton, it's a little bit of flatter look, and this one is the rayon. So I don't think that, I think you should just use whatever you have and pick the color you want. So we can use all sorts of colors, different threads. Now this, this one, I don't know if you can see how blobby this one looks. I did this one as bobbin work. So this is actually a 12 weight sparkly cord. And if we were to be able to see the back, I've used invisible thread. So it was actually hooped upside down and embroidered upside down. And it's kind of interesting. It's one of the snowflake designs and I would I didn't digitize it for this kind of thread, but hey, might work. The, um, I'm going to put this on the white, make it easier to see. This snowflake was stitched with two threads in the needle. So the snowflakes are especially thin, and they look best with a 30 weight cotton or two 40 weights through the needle. And when you do 240 weights to the needle, you might have to move up in a needle size, like to a 90, to get a better result. So here, here is that um, snowflake in a 30 weight cotton. And this is a variegated. And I put some little sparkle glue on there. This is another 30 weight thread that's sparkly. 90, size 90 needle on that one. This one. I've used three colors of metallic thread and I've used the soft light metallic. This you can treat just like 40 weight rayon. It's not quite as strong as say polyester, but it, it sews like rayon. So yes, you can sew lace with it. In fact, this whole entire angel was sewn with this color. And I think I had two thread breaks, which is pretty phenomenal in a huge design like this. So this is probably 250,000 stitches. Now unfortunately I washed too much stabilizer out of her so she doesn't hold together very well. So what about bobbins? Well you can use a matching bobbin if you want to. So you can get pre-wound colored bobbins. This is a light green or just use white. So on the back of this lace angel you can see kind of more on her hair where it's not the same matching color, but 
the stitches are so short in the wings, in the body of the wings, in the, the skirt body, that you really can't tell that I don't have a matching bobbin in there. And if your bobbin is a little on the tight side, you won't see any bobbin thread back there. So you can match your bobbin, you cannot. Um, I wouldn't recommend using a metallic in the bobbin. What I would try to do is get a 60 weight polyester thread and wind your own bobbin and match it or get a pre-wound uh, colored bobbin that coordinates with your design. So that's what we need to know about thread and needles. So next we're going to talk about machine prep and we, what, we, what we need to do to get our machine ready to sew lace. So here we have a really close-up look of two angels and I want you to see how clean and crisp this one is but then look at this one. It's got some little blobby areas here, it's got some looping and blobby areas down here and it's just not as clean and crisp as the other one. And the reason is we're having bobbin thread issues and maybe we had a couple thread breaks and maybe the machine wasn't reset properly when we started back up again but you have to have excellent sewing technique and excellent machine tensions including the bobbin tension and the top thread tension you want to make sure your machine is very clean and everything is threaded properly so uh, let me take let me show you another one this one was sewn with metallic thread this is the front of the design and obviously I haven't cut away any of the stabilizer and it looks really good but I want you to see the back look at the back <laughs> pretty bad we had major tension problems here and we have all this birds nesting garbage going on in the back and if I were to wash out that stabilizer you would definitely see all that from the front so you have to make sure no birds nests no thread breaks no thread tails. Um, when you change colors, you want to pull up the bobbin thread, and I'm going to show you how to do that next. So let's take a look at the machine. So I have my design loaded, and I'm ready to sew the first color. And before I do that, what I want to do is I want to advance to the first stitch. So on this machine, it's just plus one, and the needle moved to the first actual stitch. Otherwise, it's at the center of the design. So next, I need to bring up the bobbin thread. So I'm holding the needle thread. I have black in here just so hopefully you can see this. And on this machine, it has the needle down button. And if I press that once, it's going to drop the needle. And I press it again, it's going to bring it up. So I'm going to drop it. And then I'm going to hold on to my thread tail, bring it up. And I'll bring up my bobbin. And you probably can't see the bobbin because it's white but I've pulled it up. I'm going to hold those two thread tails and now I'm going to sew about 10 stitches and this machine doesn't stop automatically to trim so I'll need to stop the machine and trim and that's how you need to start because you don't want any thread tails on the back. Our machines today will pull that top thread to the back and there'll be a little thread tail and it'll be hanging out. Here it should get covered up and anytime you break a thread or you change a thread you're going to have to do this again. And this will keep those thread tails from getting sewn across any open areas of your design. Of course, you won't see it when you're sewing. You'll only see it once you've washed the stabilizer out. So getting great lace is all about sewing clean, making sure you have the proper tensions and that you don't have any thread tails that get hanging out anywhere. And of course, we'll find out that whether we did that next when we soak out our stabilizer and we'll do that next. So our lace is stitched and you can either cut it out while it's in the hoop or cut it out here after it's been removed and you don't have to cut out right up next to the stitching just go around you just want to get rid of the excess stabilizer and I've got two of them here and I'm just going to take some tongs and I'm just going to just do two quick little dips and then lay it on a towel. This water is really hot, oops, and I don't have asbestos fingers like some of you do. And now that I've got them on my towel, I'm just going to roll them up and get the excess water out. You do not wring the lace. So I'm just going to squeeze it 
roll it and pat it and all that stuff. And then I'm going to lay it out on a cookie drying rack. You may need to do a little bit of shaping and not so much with these little angels. They're pretty okay. And then I'll take something heavy. This is just a trivet and I'll lay that on top. If I have a whole rack of these things, what I'll do is I'll take another cookie sheet, lay that on top and put weights on it so they dry flat. The angels are pretty easy to dry that way. The tree topper angel, I formed her around a styrofoam cone and then I kind of flanged out the bottom. So sometimes your project might call for some shaping. Another one that calls for shaping are the snowflakes because they're so thin and when they have these little bitty loops, let's get the cameraman to zoom in. You can see these little bitty loops. I'll need to pin those into place. Now what, have I, what I've included with this collection is a pattern layout. So you can just print these. These are two pieces, two PDFs, and they're the exact size of the snowflake. So all I have to do is find the snowflake that matches, and they're, they're numbered according to the designs in the collection, and just pin it out and let it dry. And that way they'll hold their shape. And this is just the same way you do with crocheted snowflakes. So when I have a whole batch, like when I was doing these snowflakes and all the things on my tree here, I was stitching batches and batches of these things. So what I did was I heated up my water in a crock pot. And that way my water stayed nice and hot and evenly temperatured while I did all my dipping. And you might have to replace the water if it gets a little too gooey. But when I want this thing stiff, then, you know, having that extra in there is, is good. What you want to make sure is when you rinse it out is that you get the stabilizer out of all the little intricate areas because you can see that if you don't get it out. If you do want to get rid of all your stabilizer, you're probably going to have to soak it for quite a bit, change the water multiple times, uh, run it under a running uh, water faucet, and you can wash out all the stabilizer. So just check the stabilizer that you're using to see if it recommends hot water, warm water, cold water. I just nuke some water to boiling point and poured it in this bowl and that's how I like to work and that's why I use the tongs. So that's really all there is to making the lace. Now afterwards you, you know, might need to do some shaping or final assembly but pretty much your lace is done at this point. So once your lace is done and dry, a lot of people like to press their lace. They don't usually do this. I might do it if my lace has gotten crumpled or something, but it's not a thing that I make a habit out of doing. But when you do, you want to place your lace face down over a towel. You want something kind of soft there, and you're going to put a press cloth. I have a special little thingy here, and then you'll just press it from the back and make sure that you use a temperature that's compatible with the threads you've used. You never want to press threads that's, that are wet and you never want to press metallic thread, especially from the front. So what if you're ready to finish your lace and it's not dry yet? A hair dryer. So I do this a lot because I'm drying on a cookie drying rack. I'm actually raised and so it's very, very easy to once they've set a while under the, the weight or the tile, then I can finish dry the, drying them with a hair dryer and that speeds things up and then I can finish them. So I hope those are some great tips for finishing your lace. So let's talk about a few embellishment options you can do. This angel down the bottom with the gold on it, all I did on that one was I used some of this glitter glue and dabbed it on with a toothpick. So that's how I got it on the little dots around her halo. And I love the glitter glue. I especially like the gold and the opalescent. And you can just get these at Michael's or probably Amazon. And what I've done with the opalescent is I've dotted it on the little French dots that are on this. And I don't know that you can see them on camera, but from here, they look like little sparkly lights. I've also used a variegated thread. This is a sulky blendable thread and you'll get a little variation with that. The snowflakes are great too for using two threads through the needle. So consider using silver and white metallic or silver and gold metallic and you can get some interesting effects. On this angel, 
I've done some, I've taken some uh, ink, thinned it down, and I've tinted her skirt with blue, and then I added a little bouquet with some teeny dried flowers, and I also smeared some of the glitter glue, the gold glitter glue, on her wings with my finger, and added a little ribbon at the top for hanging. So there are things you can do to make your angels more fun. Another fun one to do is with the crystals. So you can hot glue crystals on your angels and your snowflakes. They might be a little heavy for the snowflakes, so make sure you get them extra stiff for doing that. So let's talk a little bit about problem solving with lace. I've talked about one big one already, and that's the blobby thread on the back. So assuming that that's not the issue, another common problem is that the design falls apart. And this can be due to tension problems. Your tensions are too tight, so they, as the sewing goes in, it gets pulled apart and it doesn't interlock properly. Or maybe your stabilizer is slipping because you have too many in the hoop or some other reason that causes the stitches not to interlock. So what I would do first is I would test the designs under optimal conditions. So if you have combined a whole bunch of small designs in a large hoop, try sewing that same design in a small hoop, making sure your tensions are all correct and, and all that good stuff. And then rinse it out, rinse out the stabilizer, and rinse it all the way out. So there's no, nothing in there to help hold the design together. And kind of tug on it a little bit and see, does it fall apart? And if it doesn't fall apart, well, then it's not the design, it's some other thing that's going on. But if your design is falling apart and you, you've tried everything, you might contact the uh, digitizer to see what's going on. Or maybe the design was intended to be sewn over netting. So designs that are intended to be sewn over netting, the netting will su provide support for all those stitches. And, you know, if you don't hear back from the digitizer, the digitizer says, you know, I don't have that problem, you know, you can see the scanned version on my website, then just put some English netting down or some other fine netting, maybe even some sparkle organza because that can be pretty, and then just trim it away later on in the design, later on when you finish the design, and that way it will give your design a lot of support. That's also a good thing to do if you're going to use the pieces in some way that they're going to get more abuse than they would normally get. So designs that you're going to hang on a Christmas tree aren't going to get a lot of abuse. But if you're going to put it on, I don't know, a keychain, then you need to do something else because it's just not going to hold up. It's not going to stay stiff. And one thing to understand about lace is because we put in all those extra stitches to help support it, it's probably not a very good design to sew as direct embroidery or normal embroidery on fabric. When we sew normal embroidery, the fabric itself supports the design. And with all those extra stitches, it can be a little too dense for regular fabric. So that's a good thing to know. So another tip is don't resize lace designs. They are so intensely digitized that, especially on the ones that aren't designed as instant lace, that they just might not hold together anymore. So you don't want to shrink them down because they already have a lot of short stitches in them and enlarging them could cause parts not to connect properly. So you know, if you resize a lace design and something happens, well, you were warned. And one final tip is if, let's say you get these angel designs. Before you go crazy and sew hundreds of them, before you start rinsing them out, sew one. Whenever you get a new design or a new collection, you should always sew at least one and see how it works. So I would take one design, sew it all the way through, and rinse it out and see how it stands up. And make sure you don't have any problems. Make sure that when you hold it up and you look through it, it's all clean and crisp. You don't see any thread tails going across. You want to make sure you have your technique down before you do a whole batch of those things. And remember, you can get this little lace design at 50% off, just use the coupon code that you see on the screen below. And thanks for watching.